everybody. It's Crystal Ann Compton. How are you doing? I hope you are having a beautiful day wherever you are on the planet today. In today's video, I'm really excited because I'm going to be presenting you um, a recorded version of my Life Magnetics podcast in which I talk with the gorgeous Elenique Marie. Now, I've known Elenique for several years now, and I, which I, I say in this, I say in this interview, but I regard her as just such a beautiful spirit on this planet. Elenique is a master teacher of the A Course in Miracles content, and she is also a hypnotherapist. And she has just a lot of cool insight about ourselves, our shadow, about the process of hypnotherapy. And of course, during this interview, I ask about alien abductions and whether we can get into the memories of that with hypnotherapy, because I got to keep it weird. But she's just, she's just a great guest. And I, I know you're going to enjoy this interview. Now, before we get into it, I just want to remind you to please like, comment, subscribe, subscribe, follow, do all of the social things. It really does help me out in the algorithms and it helps the work that I do. All right. Without any further ado, let's get into my conscious conversation with Elenique Marie. Elenique, um, welcome to my podcast. I'm not sure if by the time this airs, I have renamed it. I'm not sure. <laughs> but right now it's Life Magnetics. And I just want to start by saying you are probably one of the most beautiful people I've ever met on the inside and the out. There is just an inherent wisdom and compassion and love. I'm getting teary eyed, actually. There's just something so beautiful about you. So I'm really honored that you would be here today to talk about your life and your work and so that people can get to know who it is that you are. So welcome. Thank you, Crystal. You're welcome. And I feel the same way about you. <laughs> <laughs> you well, know. I want I like to start kind of um, with how it all began. And so many intuitive people and connected people have had experiences as children, maybe with imaginary friends or energy or just their sensitivities. And then they kind of develop and ultimately have a spiritual awakening or become conscious to why all of that is happening. So for you, did you have any types of experiences as a child? And if so, what were they? You know, I was a very, very strange kid. And looking back now, I can appreciate just how strange. Um, I had this obsession with the saints. I mean, I was raised Catholic, but I remember just being two or three or four years old and just asking my mom for books. Like, I want a book about, you know, St. Francis. I want a book. I don't know where I knew, but I, it was this thing that I, and, um, when I would get asked like in elementary school, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, a saint. You know, so I had this, this thing and I love to pray ever since I was a little girl. Like as soon as they gave me that kid's Bible, it is worn out and I still have it, you know? So, but there was this sense of God. I had this sense that there was this presence, this, this energy that loved me and that I missed terribly. It was this aching emptiness, this sense of like separation and not rightness. I felt very not at ease in the world. Like I just couldn't feel right. And that started me on the path of like prayer, you know, and searching and reading and studying. Um, and really, it was a lonely, it was kind of lonely. I felt quite lonely as a child because I had all these questions. And when I would ask the grownups, they would just be like, why are you, who, what are you talking about? You know, that makes no sense. What a weird question. I would, I would literally get that. What a weird question for a little girl, you know? Right. So, um, so yeah, it was always a passion and a, and a hunt for this coming back to God or whatever, you know, source. So yeah, that's that, um, my soul follows hard after you, like a deer panteth for the water. You know, it's just that longing of the soul to be in communion with your source or with all that is. I, I totally, I totally get that. When I stumbled into Christianity in my teens, first of all, I was looking for a father figure because my father was, you know, off the rails on a crazy train. But I, it was the first time I felt that beautiful Abba father, daddy father, that connection to the divine that also felt so personal. Like I did recognize that it was a remembrance of a state of being, right? Absolutely. That's what it is. And you, you remember, but like in a dream that you can't recall when you're awake. And so there's this nagging feeling in the background that you're wasting your time. And people would talk about, you know, my family is a business family, a lot of generations of working in the same family business and everything is business. And I just felt like this does not speak to me at all. I don't care about money. I don't care about 
I want to experience liberation, freedom, union, peace, peace above all things. I felt so unpeaceful, you know, as a child. So, um, so that was what, what pretty much inspired my entire life. It's all been about that my whole life. What is your view now on Catholicism and the saints? So I believe, I mean, I think the saints are very interesting because they are testimonies to faith. And I do believe that there's a place for religion, depending on your personality and your needs and your level of spiritual development. Um, and some people like a lot of, um, what do we call that? Like, uh, just show ritual. Pomp, you know, right. Right. And circumstance that mm -hmm. helps them to connect. And I think there should be a place for that. Catholicism in general, uh, it's not something that I can subscribe to because so much of the things that they say I'm in disagreement with. But this, but I don't judge Catholicism by the Catholic Church. I I I look at the, the message of Jesus within Catholicism. So I, you know, I accept it. I have no problems with it, but I don't consider myself Catholic. Interesting. My, my second husband was a Catholic and he was the kind of Catholic that just loved being a Catholic. You know, you get a lot of bitter Catholics out there who are just very angry at the church, but he just loved it. And I would go to mass with him from time to time and coming out of fundamentalist Christianity, there was just such a difference in terms of the, I want to say texture, of the, like the, just the, the energy of reverence and sacredness and that pomp and circumstance that you're talking about just felt, it was really beautiful to me. I actually tried to convert and become a Catholic, I had to go, I forgot what the process is called, but it was like a six month process. And I had to get my previous marriage annulled. And I did all of that. And the weekend before I was to convert, there was a problem with the paperwork and they wouldn't let me do it. And I was just like, oh, well, that's what Catholicism the system is. <laughs> it's the right. paperwork of it all. But I was attracted to the mysticism, especially the Catholic mystics like Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross and all of those cool saints. And those people put their money where their mouth was, you know, it's like, I find that um, when you risk your life to believe in something, there's an authenticity there. And nowadays, a lot of people preach a lot of things, but there's no skin in the game because there's really no risk. I mean, you can just say whatever. Yeah, sure. But there, when you know you could be a martyr and eaten by lions or like crucified on a cross and you still do it, to me, that shows a very deep spiritual connection that you must have with something. So it still inspires me. I still find, and some of the writings, I mean, still inspire me. Absolutely. You know, Thomas Aquinas, I love to read. Uh, mm -hmm. Love to read, you know, his writings. So, yeah. so when did you set out from Catholicism as the system into your own path? And what did that look like for you? Well, my undergraduate was in theology, Judeo-Christian theology. Because I was, I thought I'm going to go and I'm going to go to divinity school. That's what I wanted to do, you know. Um, but the more that I studied the Bible, I was a little bit. It, it let me down. Uh, the, the a lot of the things that were included in it, the way it was being taught, the way it got put together, it just created a lot of doubt in me. Because up until that point, I was pretty much zealous about it, you know. And so I, but I had been meditating for some weird reason since I was like 14. I had a lot of Indian friends, Hindu friends, and um, they had their gurus. And because I was just a weird spiritual little kid, whenever any of their gurus were in town, I'm like, can I come? Can I come? And they're like, yeah. So I had that sort of um, mysticism from the, you know, that tradition growing up. And as I found like traditional religion less and less fulfilling, it became easier and easier to start to delve more into that type of mysticism, which was a much more direct relationship with God. You know, no hierarchy, just sit down, close your eyes, breathe, connect. And that's where everything started to change. And how old were, how old were you at that time? I would say 20, 20 okay. years old, Young somewhere around 20, when it, things started to change from Catholicism to more spirituality. So what brought you to meditation as such a young person because i recall in the church meditation well i was in pentecostal church so we were all nuts <laughs> so but that was demonic to meditate so i don't know what it was like in the catholic church but how did you get started with that well it was again because these friends that i had that had all these amazing gurus that came from india oh, okay okay they would do these trainings three-day trainings and uh it was just meditate sit down on a pillow and sit or they would but the energy of these people was like, you could almost feel light, like a light 
was just emanating in a piece that allowed you to just sit, even though I hadn't had any experience with it. I just sat down and I was like, I've never felt this happy. I've never felt this peaceful. And so, yeah, so the meditation started there, like with them. At around what, what did your mama think? What did your family think about you? Thank God my mom was, my mom's not Catholic. I mean, she's Catholic, but she stopped being Catholic a long time ago. And she was very, she's spiritual. So she, she went with me a couple of times. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so she was open and my dad's very traditional, but he doesn't like to talk about it anyway. So it wasn't an issue. I just knew better than to have a conversation with him about right. you know, meditation. So take us from, you know, your 20 years old or your early 20s and you're walking the path um did you would you say that you experienced a distinct spiritual awakening and if so what was that like well i i don't know that it was a specific thing but it was definitely a journey and um i had my like dark nights of the soul you know where there was just so much despair about so many things like i really couldn't understand how to find my footing in life because I felt so like what I valued, nobody else validated. This is not this age where you can just go on YouTube and there's a community waiting for you. Back then I was really not like anybody else in my social circle. So after being really, really depressed uh, and, and just not being able to function for a while, I finally got to the point where something, something just came into me, this piece. And it said, you just need to trust that it will all, like, you will see it. It will manifest itself. Just trust. Don't keep trying to make things happen. Just relax. And that's what I did. So I, I put it kind of on the side and just got to dealing with regular life. But then people started coming into my life. Teachers, books. I started with A Course in Miracles. That came into my life at that time. And that changed, like, everything. When I did A Course in Miracles and I realized the power of the mind, and how really all healing is healing the mind. And that there is this loving energy called Jesus that can be there as a teacher. And, and you don't have to believe in Jesus as the Christian Jesus, just that there is someone that walked the path and experienced realization within a tradition that I understand. For me, that was, and it tells you what to do. <laughs> 365 lessons, do the lessons, read the book, change. And so how old were you when you stumbled upon or flowed into A Course in Miracles? I'd say around 24, 24 okay, was so pretty really after, after at, the, the, at the moment of my crisis. That's why I'm telling you that I think all the time God is always guiding us. Source is always guiding us. It's giving us the tools that we need for whatever stage we're at, um, but we have to accept them. We have to accept them and we have to trust. Trust is the hardest thing. It really, really is. Right. Especially when we're so egoic, you know, when, oh, I'm going to run this show. And I was a control freak. Were you? You, know? you don't seem, you don't seem I, I egoic was. to me at all. Like, you don't seem like you would have like a problem of personality like that, were you? Why were you, why were you so controlling? I was controlling because I felt like I didn't have a lot of control, I think, as a child. Um, and I uh, loved school and I loved excelling at things. I think a lot of my self-worth was tied into my academic abilities or my intelligence. So that was sort of what I always fell upon for value, like for my self-value. I was like, oh no, but I, I know I can control this and I can do this. And um, also just, I wanted to assert myself because I felt like there was so much change in my life as a child that I had no control over, but it was a false sense of safety. It was completely a false sense of safety and it actually kept me from being safe you know, right. trying to lean, lean not on your own understanding right it's like but we, we do just trust control is is often anxiety you know just trying to <laughs> right bring that anxiety into something that you can manage through control or something else yes. so I, I met you um a few years ago and so I'm not, I won't say your age, but I know you're, you know, you're past your 20. So you've been doing and um, embodying A Course in Miracles for quite some time. Um, do you presently teach it? I am working on a course that's actually going to start in a month. So um, what? Tell me about this. Are you kidding? <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, it's going to be, um, I want to do a class that it's going to meet two times a week online. And um, we're going to go over the workbook lessons. 
and the text so that it can be like a full journey through it. It's going to take about 18 months. Oh my gosh, can I join? Yes. <laughs> oh my God, I would love to, because I mean, I think we talked about this last year sometime, but I mean, with my schedule being what it is, and I was like, well, where's the groups and how do I, and I just kind of didn't do it. Absolutely. I would. Well, I'm going to record it too. So the, the point is that whoever joins it can watch it at their leisure. They don't have to be there, you know, live to watch it. It would be great because of course it builds community, but um, but yeah, but for me, The Course in Miracles, as you know, um, my oldest son passed away three years ago. And when that happened, it was when I had to really see if I could live those principles. Because I think when you believe something and you think you're in a spiritual place, you think you're in a, spe a specific place, but then something really bad happens. And that's when you realize that you really weren't where you thought you were. And so I really had to, I felt like my son's passing was that opportunity to, to say, do I really believe there, that, that there is a loving God? Do I really believe that there is a purpose for everything? And can I not make myself a victim? And can I stop these ideas of victimization and utilize it for uh, creating change, positive change for people and giving love and helping other people that are suffering? And that's what that gave to me. So that's really when I feel, and also when, you know, that my son was sick for 10 years before he died. So that, that time period was when I think it got honed, you know, just honed and honed. And he's my biggest teacher. You know, my son is my angel. He's my teacher. He continues to inspire me. And I know that he came as part of my, my life plan. Do you have any advice for someone who would find themselves in such a huge life situation and it, it feels kind of to me like you enter into this energetic grid or zone of just uh, a certain quality of energy and you're, you're feeling fear you're feeling grief you're feeling overwhelmed and you're just in this cloud of that and so it can really obfuscate your connection you know people can get so lost when they enter into those kinds of seasons so the fact that you were able to at some point become clear about asking the right questions throughout it and and really what can I what can I learn from this is to me such an enlightened position to take and I think most people would have a hard time even getting there is there something that you would what helped you to start asking the right questions what helped you to start looking for that connection again I think ultimately it's the experience thank God that I had meditation from a very young age and that I knew what it was like to sit in silence with God or source experiencing that peace prior to these things happening. I think it's a hard thing to try to capture once you're already in a very dark, heavy place because you don't know what it feels like. So you don't even know towards what am I moving? What am I trying to get back to? So just remembering that just remembering what real peace feels like and how it doesn't depend on anything. It doesn't depend on a job. It doesn't depend on a husband. It doesn't depend on anything. It's a choice. It's a state that you enter willingly when you let everything else fall away. So that training helped. But if someone was starting from scratch right now, ironically, I'm going to tell you that the thing I find the strongest that help, that is helpful is hypnotherapy. That's why I became a hypnotherapist because I find that that's the way to talk to the subconscious, to give it resources that it may not have to cope with the situation in a very gentle and very quick way so people can feel relief. Because if they can't feel relief, they cannot try, they cannot change, they cannot get out of that darkness. We need to let them experience that state, which you can do through hypnosis. And once they feel, oh, this is what it feels like again, okay, now I want to go for that. You have a them. reference point or kind of like a destination. Yes. So okay. I would say that next to meditation, hyp hypnosis and hypnotherapy is the thing I find the most powerful for so, change. Now, the hypnotherapy that you do is not like the hypnotherapy that Dolores Cannon did, which is, or is it? It, it is, it is, uh, I mean, I know how to do past life regression mm -hmm. and, and, and I, and I've done that, but, but, but my issue with past life regression is if you want to do it for fun, I think that's great. Go for it. You know, go explore your past lives. But the problem is that every life we've ever had has culminated in this present moment. All the learnings, all the mislearnings, everything is here right now, manifesting in this current moment where we have some control over the storyline. We can go back to childhood. We can identify what happened. 
But if we open the box of crayons of past life, how are we ever going to become accountable for what we do? And how are we ever going to take responsibility for the change that has to happen now? So I respect it. I do think there's some, you know, maybe 10% of things that really would benefit from a past life regression. But in general, I want to be here right now in a very tangible place where we can own our story and deal with our history and transform it now. And by transforming it now, you transform the past because there is no present and there is no future and there is no past. It's all happening now. So, you know. Do you think past life regression is possible? Like, do you think that you can use hypnosis to access actual past lives and that's a real real experience or do you think that's just a space i get to go into and start telling me telling myself a story because that's what it felt like when i did it yes so, uh, okay. so i believe that the subconscious is extremely powerful and it speaks in metaphor so and what is more you know more metaphorical than a past life um so the question of whether it's real or not i don't know right i don't know i don't have that skill set i you know i, I don't uh, talk to dead people or, you know, like I don't have those sort of clears. Uh, I don't minimize it because some people truly believe that it is real and I honor that. And um, some people think it's metaphor, but whatever it is, it is very powerful because why does your mind pick a certain memory? Why does it pick a certain time? Why are certain people in that memory? Their language, you know, the, the subconscious is saying, hey, understand your problem like this. There's a mom figure. Oh, maybe there's an issue with mom. Even the one that you have that you can't look at it because when I talk, if I talk about mom now, it's too much. I'm not disassociated, but float me off to 200 years ago in Egypt. Now I can talk about mom, but it's not really mom. So it gives us, gives us space to explore certain things that I think are very powerful. And some people want to do it up close and some people want to do it removed. Hmm. That's interesting because I think that's uh, probably what I experienced because I still felt that the regression itself was quite meaningful because I was able to pull from what I experienced, uh, pull that into or extrapolate that into my current life at the time. Like those were, I could relate those to lessons that I was in process of learning. But I would say, I, I um, hypnosis when I did it, and I've done it, I think twice. Uh, really isn't what I had imagined it would be because you see all these stage hypnotists, you know, and causing somebody to quack like a duck and walk around the stage all nuts. So I thought like you'd be in such a profound state of disassociation or somnambulism, but it wasn't, it was so light. It was just a little bit of a click out. So, you know, it depends. it depends on who you're working with. Um, I went, I, I studied hypnosis in three different places because I didn't feel that any of the places had really met the what I felt was necessary for true spiritual change. And I'm not in, I mean, I can help somebody quit smoking, but that's, I don't think that's my life path. You know, ultimately I want to cause healing spiritually mm -hmm. for people, allow, facilitate. So the last place that I went to my last, which is my school that I adore and now I work for is the uh, IIH, the um, uh, Interpersonal Institute of Hypnotherapy. And what they teach is interpersonal hypnotherapy, which is really heavily based on the concepts of A Course in Miracles, of um, all healing is forgiveness, and that we don't just go into hypnosis for fun. We go there to heal something and use a lot of protocol. So, and we take a lot of time to deepen people. And I think that's one thing that if you have somebody that wants to just give you a progressive relaxation, you're not going to get deep enough for hitting that place that you're describing, you know, that place where you're, but definitely I've had someone that I worked with for surgery and got them so, so deep, they didn't need anesthesia. Wow. So when you can operate someone without anesthesia, trust me, you're in a very mm -hmm. deep place, right? And um, that's an Esdale state. That's something this, this doctor actually was able to understand how to bring the mind there, but it's a long process. Very How long? Cool. Like hours? Well, for example, for that, what I would do with them is um, condition them like, like practice. So you have to build it so that eventually just with very few triggers or words, they can, they can drop into mm -hmm. the state. So you, you basically are acclimating them to that. Um, but it takes, you can work with somebody for months to try to 
to really get them there. We, I now I've started something with uh, pregnant women so that they can have the baby without epidurals and they can pretty much numb their lower body with their mind because you can, you have the, the mind can numb anything. It can, it can numb your mind. It can actually numb you out and it can, it can do, I mean, think about when people think they're having a heart attack, but it's a panic attack mm -hmm. or hysterical pregnancies or people that have cured themselves with the power of their own mind. No, nope, I'm healthy and they do it. So we can, the mind is so powerful. And that's the shame is that we don't understand what truly magical, powerful beings we are because we got told that we're just human. People just love to say that, oh, you're just human. I don't think we're just human. I think we're fully spirit wearing these human costumes. And if you can tap into that dimension, you can do anything, anything that you want. I really do believe that. So working with hypnosis with someone like you as the practitioner, would somebody be able to do something like um, activate their intuitive faculties or have you ever, okay, I've got, a, I've got a few questions. So let's start with that. And then I'm gonna write the other ones down or else I'll forget. But do you work with people to sort of remove spiritual blocks or activate intuition? Well, the funny part is, so when we do the uh, regressions sometimes, what we'll find is that there'll be like an entity Right? So somebody's carrying around an entity that has attached to them and they don't even know. And this oh, thing is, what? Yeah. <laughs> entity. So we do entity, you release entity attachment. Sometimes it comes up even when I'm just doing like a childhood regression, which is what I'll normally do to get to the root cause. And then you start talking to the part and the part, that part of them that sounds like it's a, a, an aspect of self is really like this energetic and whether it's some very strange part of their mind mm -hmm. or a literal something that's taken over, it perceives itself as an entity. And so you deal with it in the same way. And basically it's talking to this thing and saying, what do you need? What do you need? Because at the end of the day, everything wants to feel better. If you have a spirit that's, that's running around scaring people, right? If you believe in that type of thing, it's because it, it has an unmet need. What does it need? It wants wholeness. We all want wholeness. And the further we are from wholeness, the more we lash out. And so our job is to hold space to bring that back into the wholeness. Bring that part in with love, not, not with fear. Fear will only feed it. Are you talking about integrating the entity into the self? Or are you talking about yeah, cutting into cords the self and, and releasing it into the light? I mean, eventually once, once because we all are that wholeness, we, there is no separation. There is only an illusion of separation, right? So once we show this aspect that it doesn't need to run these behaviors, that there is a way to get what it wants without torturing this person psychologically, that thing will let go most of the time. I mean, I honestly haven't had any time where it hasn't. I really how do, haven't. How do you distinguish whether it's an entity or an aspect of self and to like, do you feel that intuitively as the practitioner? Do they declare themselves as an entity? Like, how does that happen? You know, I, I go off with the client because it, I don't want to put a paradigm on a person that they don't, that they don't buy into. So I'm not going to start talking about entities if you don't believe in entities, right? Why would I do that? That we're going to lose rapport. Um, and um, I'm also not going to tell you it's not an entity if you believe it's an entity. Some people will come in and say, I have this entity. Okay, fair enough. Who am I to judge it? I'm here to facilitate change, to come back to wholeness. And whatever your worldview is, that's okay. We can work in all of it. So I don't, I don't frame anything for anybody. I really let them frame it for me. That's why the intake is so long. I take like 45 to 50 minutes just taking the intake because I need to understand everything about this person's worldview. You know, how do you see the world? So I can talk to you in a way that makes sense. Do you do this in person or can you do this online as well? I do both. I do Zoom, uh, Zoom, especially over COVID, you know, it right. became mm -hmm. so, and, uh, and I do some at my office here, like where I live. But, um, you know, I obviously love to have it in my office because I like to create like a an, like an energetic feeling for people to step into. Mm -hmm. Sometimes on Zoom, you know, you'll be in this very deep place and suddenly like a cat will land on somebody's right. head or, you know, right. like, right. but it still works. And that's what I was, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that you could facilitate something like that over a computer. 
And it's, so it, it's as effective, you would say, you would prefer to be in yeah. person, but it is as effective. Because I'm just a people person. I like to be with people. I like right. to be in the space with them. But, but even I've had to open my mind to mm -hmm. what does it really mean to be with somebody? There really is no distance. So why, why create this illusion of separation again? You know, right. here we go with that. So. Well, let me switch gears while we're still in hypnotherapy, but um, I was always very, you know, I'm an older person, so I came up through the satanic panic, I came up through alien abduction and regressing into the alien experience, and my sense of, of the work of, I think, Bud Hopkins and, and people who did this was that it was very leading in hypnotherapy and kind of asking questions that would guide somebody down a train of thought and with the satanic panic kind of the same thing you know you have you're leading people into this uh, belief that this happened to them and, and i think when you're t when you're playing around in states like that and they're experiencing it in in a session of hypnotherapy it is extremely real and that's why it's believable you know that this and they believe that this happened to them but i was always wondering like did it though or is this something that the hypnotherapist actually implanted so what do you think about uh regressing for uh memory regressing to remember an experience is there anything that we should know about that well what i what i do is i believe that the most important thing in a regression is that we don't lead like the, the protocol that I utilize, it's, you know, we, we, talk, we get the language about the, what is the problem? What are you feeling? What emotions are you feeling because of it? What beliefs do you hold because of it? Okay. Then we relax them. And then we say, when I count to three, you're going to be back in the memory that is the cause of this problem that you currently have. Three to one, where are you now? Is it inside? Is it outside? Is it day? Is it night? I will not suggest anything to anyone. And usually you, you will, you know, you let them explore their memory. Is it the, is it the right memory or the wrong memory? I don't really think there's a way to know, except for if there's a shift later. So if the problem resolves or minimizes, you know, you've, you've, you've gotten some part of it dealt with. As far as um, the other things, I think there was a lot of leading in the past. Uh, um, and that's why I don't believe in framing things. That's why you really have to be so um, ethical with how you work with people because our imaginations are extremely powerful. And we have a lot of need to please when there's somebody we perceive as an authority. And they say, yes, but tell me, do you see the red door? Um, yeah, you know what I mean? There's this pressure to say yes, because you want to please. You want the authority to think you're you know, doing it right. And so that's why I think it's, that's the shame with hypnotherapy sometimes that you have people that are practicing it that don't, they don't have the training and they don't have the, they don't have necessarily the ethics to do and to be, and to recognize to what degree should you be going into these things? Because there are some things that we're not equipped to handle as hypnotherapists and they really must be referred to a mental health practitioner. So that's like one of my first things. If I doubt, I refer out and I wait for a referral back that says, yes, this person is stable and you can do this. But ego, you know, we go back to that ego that we're always talking about. Everybody wants to believe that they can do everything and promise everything. So it's a promise culture. You know, curcumin is going to cure your mm -hmm. whatever, you know, your um, fibromyalgia. Like, and everything is like a magic bullet. Things are not magic bullets. We each play a role and we hold space in different ways. But sometimes it takes a team to help someone. Well, going back to the red door and someone saying, yes, I see the red door because they want to please the person. I think a lot of it is also the suggestibility of the patient. Then all of a sudden they see a red door and now all of a sudden they're walking through a red door and now they're having an actual experience that they're taking for real, but thinking it's a memory or something mm -hmm. of that sort. And I think it's, I think it's potentially like, especially in the late eighties and nineties, I think it was extremely traumatizing because people left sessions and believed it. So, and and I only mention this because I think some people are scared about having the right practitioner, because if I'm under and I'm not really um, observant I, because I can't be due to my brain state, I think people are just afraid, well, what if they get in there and start tinkering around? And I'm sure you've heard that a million times. What could you say to somebody who is curious about hypnotherapy for their own development, but is a little worried about that? Absolutely. Well, there's such a distinction between stage hypnosis and hip and, and therapeutic hypnosis. Those are two totally different things. 
Um, and number two, a stage hypnotist, something they should know is that they do all these kind of tests in the audience because they're looking for the people that are easy to, mm. that are suggestible, hyper suggestible or synambulistic, as you explained earlier, right? So what you see on the stage is not what the average person is going to respond to. And those extra uh, impressionable people are like that even in life. They're easily like, those are the people that see a commercial for Burger King and jump in the car and go buy a hamburger. That they're just so easy to manipulate. That's just their set point, easily influenceable. 90% of people, 95 are not like that. That's number one. Number two, you really have to do your due diligence with who you're picking. Like the, the school that I went to has like 800 hours of training and that's the minimum. You know, that's like the minimum. So you have to don't just because somebody has a, a, a you know, a sign that says hypnotherapist and has a cool website, like ask what, how is this? How does this work? So, so that you can trust, you know, look at the reviews. And lastly, most people, in other words, hypnotherapy, even though the conscious mind is on the side over here, it's still there. And I, and I compare it to when you're on the highway driving and you kind of zone out and you go into a trance and you're listening to music and suddenly a truck comes in front of your car and suddenly you're right there with your steering wheel. So no matter what, how far down you get, if something is not to your liking or is a threat or you don't want to say it, you won't. Your conscious mind is right over here. Mm -hmm. It's just a little bit quiet so that we can talk to the subconscious. So um, you really can't, it's very difficult. It's almost impossible to get to, to those types of uh, that's places. really heartening to hear for someone who wouldn't really know that you know they do have a semblance of control because they're observing it they're popped just they're just a little shifted over here so that we can do the work but they can pop right back in as soon as and they i would tell them you'll remember everything about this session that's one of the things i say in the beginning you will remember everything clearly you will not say anything you don't want to say you will not do anything you don't want to do you're fully in control and i give given the suggestion you'll be able to get up and open your eyes and walk out of here if at any moment in time you don't feel comfortable with the session so i preempt that mm -hmm. so that they are already empowered within even the hypnotic trance to activate that and move if you don't like it you don't open your eyes tell me i don't want to talk about that and the, and if it's something that you're scared to see about your childhood then the subconscious is, is so intelligent it will never let you see what you're not prepared right to. right it, it's, it keeps that very closed. So whatever does come up, it's because you were strong enough to handle that mm -hmm. at that moment, even if there's like a suppressed memory or something, you know, that someone might be afraid. Oh, I don't think I want to remember that. Well, if you do, it's because you're ready to look at it. Yeah, I've, I've come into such a place of compassion because for a long time, you know, my brother would talk about something that would happen from our childhood. I'm like, I have absolutely no idea what you're referencing. I don't recall that at all. And I, I, would gauge that I don't remember up to 50% of my childhood due to trauma. And there is one experience that I had as a young girl, probably five or six years old. And I remember there was a neighborhood boy who would ride the bike and deliver the papers. And he invited me to his house. And I remember going to his house and going upstairs. And at the top of the stairs in a bedroom, he asked me to take off my clothes. And from that moment, and that trigger warning, um, from that moment, I remember nothing else. Mm -hmm. And I would always ask my mom, do you remember this? And she said, I remember your father getting very upset about the neighborhood boy and going over there. I don't know what happened. Um, and, and things like that, I always thought, oh, it, it's probably important that I know what happened. It's probably important that I can get into the trauma to heal it. But now I realize my, my mind is protecting me. It's not yeah. utilizable. It's not valuable. It's not going to help me. And if anything, if it's protecting me, it's probably going to harm me, cripple me, make it harder for my development. And so now I'm like, thank you that I don't remember so much of this stuff that was very, very traumatic for me. Yeah. And that's why I have hesitations about things like ayahuasca and things that just blow open all of your protective mechanisms. Um, they're there for a reason. Evolutionary wise, it's there for a reason. Um, maturity wise, we're not always ready to process in a mature fashion and the subconscious just keeps it under wraps until we are. Now, if you go in there with TNT and blow it open and you can't handle it, how are you gonna put that back together again? Right. Are you, how are you gonna come back from whatever it is? So I think that it's, it's a very beautiful process of um, exploring to the degree to gently, exploring gently and giving space for our own inner wisdom to determine what we can and can't handle at a given moment.
Yeah, people yeah. don't want that as much, though. I mean, you do have to hit a level of maturity to understand that that's that's the flow that's necessary, especially when you're working with spiritual things. Most people just want to get in, blow it open, and have all the things, <laughs> and have all the consciousness, and have all the power. But mm -hmm. if if you do it prematurely, then you just cripple yourself. You just you disable yourself. Handle it. You can't handle it, and that's the thing that I think people don't really. Everybody wants to have all their clears. All the clears. Okay. <laughs> so, I used to be like that. I remember that. I remember just wanting to have all these things. I'd be like, why can't I see angels? I want to talk to the dead. You know, like, I want to do all of these things. And I realized if ever it had happened in the moments that I had asked for it, I probably would have ended up in an institute mm -hmm. from fear and shock. I didn't understand dominion. Mm -hmm. I didn't trust my own like intuition. I didn't have that connection with God that I felt like I could hold a sacred space. So I don't want to have that. I, I'm glad I didn't get it. Right. And I always think of that Garth Brooks songs, you know, thank God for unanswered prayers. Mm -hmm. Because if I had gotten everything I prayed for back then, I don't know what would have become of me. And I think that's the problem with the world now is just this idea that there's a, there's a race mm -hmm. rather than there's a process and life is the process it is the goal there is no goal there's only now right so be gentle be loving to yourself be here now hold space now allow for what is now and just be there is no tomorrow you know what i mean because tomorrow's right. always today tomorrow's <laughs> always today that's the part that when i finally understood that nothing has ever happened except in the now ever so why are you rushing to the future because it's still going to just be now have you ever heard of the church of last Thursday? No. <laughs> There's a church. I don't know if it's an actual church with people, but I mean, I think some people subscribe to this idea that we all just came online last Thursday and all of our memories and all of our stuff and all everything we think happened 100 years ago is just programmed into the experience. And we're really just about a week old. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> what an interesting concept, right? I love it. I love it because it's cool because it shows you that it's all, I mean, we talk about that so much like the matrix. Remember the movie, the matrix oh, yeah. and what is reality? And we're getting very close to that threshold right now with artificial intelligence and everything that the, the algorithms of all of these things that can predict what I'm going to like, you know, and uh, we we're there and I, I bet you it probably already exists. Half of the time. Have you, have you ever had something served to you that you had only thought about like an ad about something that yeah. you had only me too. That started to happen in the last six months. Mm -hmm. I had not mentioned it. I can understand if my phone's picking up through the mm -hmm. microphone or through the, mm -hmm. the tech, but I, if I'm just thinking about it, all of a sudden I'm getting a video or I'm getting an ad for it. I'm like, oh, something's going on here. I think that the capacity to comprehend um, our behavior and our interests, it, it almost mm -hmm. guesses at what you might be thinking at any given moment, right? Because if I have enough data about what happens in Crystal's mind mm -hmm. all the time, based on what you search on your computer or what you look at on your phone, I can sort of almost sense where would this mind go? So I'm predicting and guessing. And the more that I'm correct by you clicking, the better I get at that special Ooh, stuff right. called crystal, you know? Ooh, that's AI stuff for sure. Yeah. Well, so as a hypnotherapist and also a teacher of A Course in Miracles, and now you're working for an institute that aligns these two so beautifully, what's, who are, who's your ultimate client? Like the work that you just love to do as a hypnotherapist? For me, I was just telling my husband about that last night. I was like, I have an avatar. And my avatar, it's definitely usually a woman, I would say it would be a female woman, a client that is really ready to heal all the stuff that's getting in the way of her greatness. That whether it's childhood trauma, whether it's adult trauma, um, self-esteem issues, whatever. I just want to be able to work with people to say, look, I can see you the way you really are. And I'm gonna hold that space for you to heal this stuff so that you can shine your light and, and bless us all with it. Because the more healed that we are as a community, that's what we need. And all these issues of, you know, the wars happening here and there, I'm praying for it and doing what I can do. But bottom line is we change the world by changing ourselves. It's really not that complicated. It's all right here in our own backyard. So if I can help, I can relate to women. I, I feel very strongly about, I identify as a woman, even though I know that's dualistic, but I do. 
And um, that's who I would love to work with is a person that's really ready for change and ready to heal and ready to say enough is enough. I want to let it go. <sighs> that feels really good. <laughs> that feels really good and light. And um, I, we have actually spoken about working together a little bit and with hypnotherapy and, and I want to do that. I'm open to that. And I would just say to anyone, I mean, I would, I would strongly recommend you based on integrity, character and ability truly. And I don't say that I really don't offer things that I don't believe in or that I haven't tried or that I haven't vetted in some way, but you, you just, to me have um, impeccable energy in this way. So if anybody is interested in doing this kind of work, Elenique, how would they find you? Well, my website, so my company is called EM Hypnosis, Elenique Marie Hypnosis. So emhypnosis.com is my website. I have a YouTube channel by the same name, EM Hypnosis. And I make some videos, you know, just about sort of these questions, like how do we, how are we more present in our day-to-day -day life? I'm starting a series now about parenting. So conscious parenting and really um, how do you talk to children? So they will listen. And how do you listen so they will actually talk? Because I read that book and it changed my life. And it was really something that my son gifted me, you know, Noah, that I was just like, I wish I had known what I know now when I was his mom, because mm -hmm. I think I could have been an a, a even better mother, you know, and uh, he would have had a better time, you know, in the world if I could have just held space for him to be an individual. You know, so, so that's what I want to, I really want to work with moms on that too. I feel very strongly that all we're here to do is not mess them up. If you just don't mess them up, they're already equipped to be amazing. I feel like I lost that opportunity. <laughs> I mean, my daughter's perfect though. Like she's, she's great, right. but I, I don't feel, I feel like, um, you know, and that's just the, that's just the lament of the mom and the dad, I'm sure too, but just like, oh, if I could just go back. And when you think of your babies, you know, when they were so little, you know, I just, or I look at one of her pictures when she's two or three or four, I just start crying because, oh, I feel in myself lost opportunities to love even more deeply. Like I have access to now, you know, yes. it would be so wonderful to, to get moms to become present with that. Absolutely. And for me, that's really what I feel like was I feel my whole life has been my children are the most important thing to me. And my spirituality, spirituality and my children, those are the, the, the bread and butter of my everything. And so whatever I can do to help other people have the, you know, not have to have the mistakes that I have made, what, you know, however, whatever they may be, and, and to benefit from the things that I have learned along, along the, the way, because children are so fragile. They're so fragile. They're so impressionable. We really can do such damage with mm -hmm. such small words, such small things. People think, oh, well, it's the parents that beat the kids up. Those are the ones with problems. No, they're not. Mm -hmm. it's, it's such small things that we do that make people have insecurities because you can't process what they're processing. You don't know what they hear and how they take it in. So just to, to have that loving speech, loving kindness when you speak to them, really, really, not to say I love you, but be loving with your words, with your thoughts, with your impressions of them. And, and honestly, it comes from healing yourself. You right. cannot, mm -hmm. we get triggered by our children because they trigger our insecurities. They trigger our guilt. Our if you heal your guilt and you heal your insecurities, you can't hurt anybody, especially your children. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, okay, so YouTube uh, also under EM Hypnosis. So if I go to emhypnosis.com, would I also be able to sign up for your A Course in Miracles? It's going to be up there next week because I just had a rebuild of the website. So hopefully by next week. Awesome. Well, that I think this will be up by the time your website is ready so people can go. Awesome and check it out. Um, I Do you have a few more minutes to just talk yeah. about something? Okay. I wanted to talk to you about narcissism because I see, a, I see just a lot of people talking about the narcissist in their life. And sometimes I wonder, I don't know if you really know what an aberrant personality disorder narcissism is. And I was talking recently to one of my friends about how narcissism shows up to me clairvoyantly, like how I can kind of pick, how I can kind of get in intuitively and know somebody's a narcissist. And for me, what it shows up like is first the color is, um, well, kind of baby poop, gold, brown. <laughs> it's a kind of this muddy kind of color yeah. in, and the energy is almost like puzzle pieces that are, um, all chaotic, nothing's aligned, but it's from the vantage point of the, 
narcissist, it's making pure sense, like the chaos is, is organized. But from my my clairvoyance from the outside in, it looks like just a bunch of puzzle pieces not in the right place. And my sense energetically is that it is a really hard personality issue to heal. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there are like, for example, um, I'm not saying narcissists are the same as pedophiles, but that's another one that's really, really hard to heal. Um, because, and I'm not sure why as a soul, somebody would come in and take the mantle of I'm going to be a narcissist or a pedophile. And that's something I'm going to probably have to experience through this entire life. Like, why would you have such a soul stain? And with hypnotherapy, do you, how do you encounter narcissism? And how does that show up? And through hypnotherapy, can somebody work through that? And or if somebody's the victim of an arc, would hypnotherapy help? I think that uh, in answer to your first question, um, they can he the person that is a narcissist will heal to the degree that they want to, to the degree that they're willing to see differently, to get perspective on themselves, because probably enough people have left them, abandoned them, criticized them, or, you know, they just have a life that's not showing up and they wonder why does everybody not like me? You know, it they certainly can't be me. <laughs> no, it's not me. I'm such a great person. You know, and so to the degree that you're willing to say the outside behavior from people is a mirror to me of who I am and what people are reflecting back to me. It can't, you know, if it's one person that hates you, okay. If, if everybody in your life has a problem with you, you got to look at yourself. But a lot of times people are unwilling to do that. So, and usually not narcissists, right? They'd rather be- so does that mean narcissists essentially can't be helped? I mean, I know we're talking in absolutes and of course they can be helped if they get the proper consciousness and self-awareness, but like the likelihood statistically, it just seems like it, it doesn't shift or change at all. No, um, I have a couple. In my life. <laughs> <laughs> right. You would think that as things have happened, you know, certain major things happen and you think, oh, now they're going to learn because this is a big lesson. And it's like, you know, water off a duck's back, it just goes right back. It's a very strong, um, it's a very strong filter. Yeah. And um, yeah, nobody can change that doesn't want to. And the thing I always tell people about hypnotherapy is I'm not doing something. You're doing it. I'm facilitating. So it's to the degree that you want to change, you will change. I cannot make it happen you know, for you. Uh, with regards to someone who is in a relationship with a narcissist, yes, because there's a reason they're in that relationship. And it usually has to do with the childhood. You're normally with a narcissist because you had a narcissistic parent. And so it feels normal and safe for you to be with a person that isn't emotionally available, is constantly asking for more than you can give, nothing you ever do is good enough. That's because that's so familiar, that signature, that you're like, oh, this feels like home, messed up but feels like home. Right. Substitution. So, exactly. So if we can heal the memory of the childhood and the learnings and the beliefs that were generated by that childhood, then you can, then they'll automatically just let that person go because it doesn't fit anymore. The vibration doesn't match. Interesting. Yeah. Um, last question before I let you go. Um, how does your intuition, because of course that's how I came to know you, right? We have this interest in common, uh, psychic abilities, intuition, manifestation, all of these things. How does your intuition show up in the work that you do? Does it guide you in the way that you hold space? Um, what, what? Completely. I, I, when I go into a hypnotherapy session, I do a meditation 20 minutes before I have a client. And I go into the place where I pretty much let spirit guided. I have, I have knowledge. I have technique. I, of course I use technique, but I don't really consider that I'm doing it. I almost put myself into like a trance with the, with the client so that I am not letting my ego tell me where to go. And sometimes like I had a client and, um, I felt something. And the reason I do meditation before is because I want to check what's in my body before I get in the room with them. So do I have pain in my, you know, my ovary? Okay. Then that's mine. That's my stuff. So I can recognize what's their stuff. So mm -hmm. this day I did the meditation. I didn't have anything. And then I do the, the, the session with her and I felt this pain in my ovaries, like so deep. And after, you know, we were done with the session, I said, look, I don't want to freak you out or anything, but just maybe for it to, to validate to you that some of the information that we received is 
legitimate. This is what I felt that she like bounced out of that chair. She was like, oh my God, that's exactly what I felt. I was feeling it in my ovaries. So I trust that God and spirit are there, that they're the ones doing the healing, that higher self of that person is the one that's doing the healing. And I, I go with it. I just go with, I hear it. They're like, ask about this, go there. And I follow. And I used to not because I used to be a control freak. <laughs> I used to think I knew better. But now that I got out of the way, it's so much more beautiful and effortless and transformational for people. Mm-hmm. It's a very spiritual experience. You know, it's a very spiritual thing. to have I imagine, that kind of I imagine that it would be, especially with a guide like you, that it would be. And I tell my students, number one, like in any program, whatever it's about, number one, you got to get out of your own way because if spirit's present and if spirit's occupying, then spirit's always going to get it right. <laughs> so it's not about it's not about techniques to talk to angels. It's about techniques to get out of your own way and stop needing to control the process and just allow the flow to happen. Well, Elanique, oh, did you want to say one last thing? No, no, I was just thinking about miracles and how they say that, that um, the purpose of the course is just to remove Uh, the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. That's what it is. Just remove the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. Love is always here. Joy is always here. Peace is always here. There's just blocks that we have in front of us. So we're not discovering peace. We're not growing into peace. Peace is here. We're just taking away all these cobwebs and allowing it to just be what it has always been and will always be. It's always here. Well, I love that. Thank you so much, Elanique, for hanging out with me today and doing this podcast. I think people are going to love you. I strongly recommend everyone check out emhypnosis.com just to see what you're doing. Whenever you're listening to this, even if it's three years from now, check it out because see what she's doing and and, um, all the work that you are offering. Thank you so much. I love you so much. And it has been such a wonderful time. Bye, guys. Bye.